Good evening, everyone. What a delight to be with you and explore the world of flowers. The secret language of flowers is what we're going to look at tonight. Leonard Puy and I have come from Paris to attend this incredible exhibition, Time, Nature, Love, and to give you a study guide, a guide to study in a way that makes enjoyment and fun as you go through that exhibition. You have till April. So now, tonight, you're going to become experts, and those of you at home, too, joining us at home, welcome. And you can bring your family, your friends, a widening circle to the exhibition, straight through till April, here in the Saudi National Museum, and you can be the experts. So this is going to be fun. As De La Fontaine said, if you want to learn, so let us know tonight and learn. Leonard and I are going to be very delighted to take you through this secret language. girl with her beautiful flowing auburn hair. Where do the flowers begin? Where do the leaves for the lilies begin and her hair end? Do you see the dynamic billowing waves? This is language. This is your feeling, the emotion, and the beauty of the flowers. Now tonight our discussion is about jewelry, and our discussion is also about how long has floriography existed? That is, how long have people been using the language of flowers since the beginning of time? Jewelry, adorning, using talismans, has been the earliest, as far as we know, the earliest form of human art. When we became human, we clothed ourselves and we put emblems, most likely protective talismans, on ourselves. Therefore, tonight, we're going to take a stroll through the gardens of flower symbolism and jewelry, starting with kings and queens of antiquity. Leonard's going to start us right off in Mesopotamia. And Leonard and I just walked through the exhibition here of the permanent collections at the Saudi Museum, where you can see very, very ancient third millennium BC jewels, actually pierced objects that were put on the human body. Right, found right here in, in Saudi Arabia. So since we have so much to do, we're going to go straight through to the 19th century when floriography became very important. There were a couple of people who published dictionaries of flower language, Joseph Hammer Pergstall and a French lady, Louise Cortambert, who called herself Madame Charlotte de la Tour for her dictionary of floral language. The flowers were used in a way when you couldn't say the things you wanted to say in language. So maybe you wanted to say to someone, I have a crush on you. I, I might like to marry you. You would have flowers that you would hold that would speak that language. So in the 19th century, the time of romanticism, that became very much the craze. But we're going to go all the way through. This is Art Nouveau here, 1900. That's the demarcation to the 20th century. We're going to look at the 20th century and how in what we call the Roaring Twenties, the Art Deco period. And wow, can you see some masterpieces of Art Deco in this exhibition? Time, nature, love. We're going to look at how Art Deco expressed some of the most ancient symbols, and then we're going to come right through to the most modern jewels, even jewels that use recycled aluminum, for example, to, terminate, to, dis to end our discussion today. So here we go. Are you ready? Thank you, Inesita. You, you have to understand that those books, Language of Flowers in 19th century, was, were actually bestsellers. And why were they bestsellers? Because you didn't want to do a mistake while offering flowers to a lady. You don't want to tell her like strange messages like I want to marry you or uh, you're being cheated on. So you had to pick, you had to be very careful. And for instance, if you were offering her a, a white rose, it would mean you're just my friend, nothing else. So you should you really needed uh, those books and you really needed that code to be learned and, and shared. And this is why I think it was so popular, especially in the 19th century. But as we're gonna see, there's always been uh, symbolism, uh, interpretation, meaning associated with, with flower. Uh, of course, they're ornaments, of course, they're beautiful, but there are also signs in the very uh, anthropological uh, uh, definition. And this is why we're gonna start uh, by the start, by the very commencement. 
uh, we're going to go to the Middle East, of course, we're going to go to Iraq, um, in Mesopotamia, and then uh, we'll move to uh, Asia before uh, uh, discovering together some very contemporary, modern, uh, actual interpretation, uh, of course, precious interpretations of uh, flowers. So let's start uh, by legendary plants. You're going to see they're legendary because we actually don't know what they are. Uh, if we go to, to uh, Mesopotamia, at the, the, the court of uh, Sargon uh, II, you can see here uh, on the left um, a, a, a huge, uh, a huge uh, sc a sculpture, which is in the, in the Louvre in, in Paris. And you can see the king uh, uh, Sargon, Asur Khan uh, II, facing something, <laughs> facing which looks like a plant, but there is no plant that looks like that. So there is quite a mystery, there is quite a debate also. Uh, since uh, historians, archaeologists are um, discussing what could be this pattern. Is it an actual plant? Is it a very primitive form of palm tree, for instance, with dates on it? Um, is it um, an object? Is it an artifact which is supposed to represent a tree? Or is it something miraculous, an apparition, a tree of life, as we used to say, which uh, you'll find uh, then in the Ancient Testament and so on, uh, the uh, uh, Joshua tree in New Testament, l'arbre de Jesse. And what is fascinating with this pattern is that you can see it, it comes back in many, many artifacts. And as Inezita was saying, we were rushing through the, <laughs> the collection in the museum to to, to gather all, all what we could uh, from, from the local treasures. And we found one of those seen in the seal right here with similar patterns. And um, of course, here you can recognize a, a, a tree of life once, w once again. We don't know for sure what it is, but it is there and it is important and it is natural. And it has to be interpreted because those uh, uh, cylinder seal were uh, uh, sacred in a way. They were only used by people, uh, clerical people, we could say, people uh, from the religion, uh, uh, the lettres, we would say in French. And they were uh, used uh, in clay, you know, to print a pattern which could be uh, infinite, which could be continuous. And this is why uh, those artifacts are pierce pierced vertically so that they could be used just like a, a paint a paintbrush when you're painting your, your ceiling. It would be used uh, for a continuous uh, pattern, but it could also be used as a jewel. Since it's pierced, you can wear it on a bracelet, on a, as a pendant, etc. And it's also carnelian. It's that vivid red carnelian. Leonard and I were stunned with the beautiful vivid red of the carnelian beads here in the, in the, ex, in the permanent exhibition. That was one of the earliest gems. Our ancestors believed in color, the vibrancy of color, blue for, for lapis lazuli red from carnelian, the blue of blue skies, the red of healthy blood and of courage, protection. So these were the gems that were important. Uh, and in that way, this slide is just perfect, as is our next one, which moves us both forward and back in time. On the left, you have a La Cloche Frere, you have a detail of a La Cloche Frere bracelet. That is from the Art Deco period, the Roaring Twenties. Just a few years, just a, three years after the discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb. Tutankhamun's tomb in 1922 discovered in Egypt this boy king with two tons of gold and all the splendor revealed, not having been broken open by tomb robbers because the tomb was so hastily buried and covered in a good way that it remained intact all those years. Well, that burst upon the European consciousness like a giant, healthy infusion of new blood. And everybody went crazy. They actually called it tut tut mania, Tutankhamen mania. So here you have a papyrus, that motif that looks like a fan. That's the, the, f the reed part of the papyrus. In the middle, you have the stalk part of the papyrus. And on the right, from 2017, you have a Cartier bracelet watch with 32 Zambian emeralds, showing you again that fan shape of the papyrus. So why is the papyrus so important in ancient Egypt? Why did we find those motifs and become so fascinated with them? Because even the word paper comes from papyrus. The papyrus gave life. The papyrus gave shelter. It made food possible. It made the, the, the protection actually from the sun possible. It also 
made it possible to write. And there's one of the early myths is, of course, the actual creation myth of Egypt, Isis, Osiris, the father and mother of Egypt, they have a child, a son, Horus, and the jealous brother of Set kills him, and they have to, kills Osiris, and they have to hide Horus. The mother hides him where? In the papyrus. So the actual green of the papyrus is seen as the green of protection and of health and of life. That's why that beautiful papyrus amulet, amulet in the Louvre is something to visit and think about. And by the way, that's made of faience. Faience is an imitation of turquoise made by humans. It's a high-fired pottery porcelain hybrid in a way. So people would go to the effort to create the beauty, to replicate beauty, and to make us feel protected and to make us think of how the language could be expressed from the floral plant to make us feel good. And that can come forward, as we see, in three vastly different periods of time, from 664 BCE, before the Common Era, so about 2,600 years ago, to about 100 years ago, to a couple of years ago. And next, if we go on to another potent, eloquent uh, flower symbol. Uh, Laurel Red, that's, if it, uh, when you think about jewelry, when you think about maybe plants or, fl or flower, I think uh, some of you may immediately think of such early crowns from uh, uh, Macedonia and, and, uh, and Greece. Uh, this uh, this uh, belonged to a very specific period of um, ancient Greece, which is called the Hellenistic period. It's the latest uh, uh, period in ancient Greece. It's the time right after, well, during uh, Alexander the Great, uh, even from uh, his father, and right after. And it's a time where all the craftsmen in Greece will push naturalism to the maximum. In a way, you can see the craftsmanship here is trying to imitate nature um, to the closest uh, uh, um, maximum. And it's quite fa fascinating because uh, still today, uh, we, we know a, a few of those crowns. And when you, you walk around them in museums or in, in, in glass box, they are still shaking. They are still moving, just like if the wind was passing uh, through them. So it's, it's very, very um, moving and, and, and poetical and such fragile uh, artifacts are still uh, nowadays uh, among us is uh, quite, a, quite a miracle by itself. But of course it has meaning. And uh, what is interesting is that uh, when you think of a crown, of course you'll think of hierarchy. You'll think of the top of hierarchy. And actually such crowns were offered um, when you would, um, how, how to put it, when you would go uh, through, uh, let's say, a competition when you would uh, walk all the steps of a certain hierarchy. Uh, it could be political, it could be religious, and it could be competition, and sport competition, of course. And nowadays, when we think about such uh, objects, we also think about the Olympic Games. And the Olympic Games started in Olympia, in Greece, of course. And they w those games were always dedicated to uh, specific gods. There was, uh, uh, um, uh, of course, Apollo, Zeus, uh, Dionysos, and uh, the, uh, the flower, the, the, the leaf, actually, uh, would be associated with each god. For uh, Zeus, it would be an oak tree. Uh, and uh, for Apollo, it would be a laurel. And there is a reason uh, for that, is that if you, if, if you read Greek uh, mythology, you, you read this story about uh, Apollo trying to uh, get Daphna. Uh, Daphna was a nymph. He was actually not in, lo in love with her at first. Uh, he fell in love because Cupid, well, Eros, Eros among the Greeks, decided, wanted to punish him after he insulted him. And so he, 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 he pierced, uh, he, he, he went after him with a, um, an arrow made out of gold. Like a poison arrow, yeah. Like a poison arrow. And uh, he also poisoned Daphne with an arrow uh, made out of lead. And so in this way, uh, Apollo had to fall in love with Daphne. Daphna, uh, but Daphna could never fall in love with Apollo. So it was a terrible story. Tragic. And of, of course, he was just uh, going after her like Pepe Le Pew. But uh, uh, in, in the end, uh, the, f the father of Daphna decided to protect her from him by changing her uh, into a, a laurel tree. She begged him to do it. And like this, of yeah. course, he couldn't marry a tree. Well, he almost did because he took a branch of the tree 
and kept it as uh, is an artifact. He made a, a wreath and as an artifact of how much he loved her, and that's exactly why we have today poet laureates. That's why we also say in English, don't rest on your laurels when you've gained a great yeah. prize, and that's why we have the symbol at the Olympics. Absolutely. And the Olympics will be very soon in, 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 a, yeah. in the Saudi Arabia, I think it's in four years, and maybe we'll see some, uh, some uh, artifacts, some uh, wreaths, just yeah. like the one that we see uh, on the screen right now. And of course, speaking of ancient times, the vine, the grape. The grape was the source of life, of uh, vitamins, of sustenance, and of course, also wine. And the same god, Apollo, Dionysus, uh, was connected with music, with poetry, with singing, with dance, and also with wine. Those gods were connected. And the idea is that there is an actual, you know, when it comes to the language of flowers, having grown up among gardens, my mother was a passionate gardener, it, it's all very obvious to me. A lot of our children today don't have access to really wandering around gardens and feeling what it, it all means. You watch grapes grow, and if you're growing grapes in your garden, you can take the plant and you can twine it around a t bamboo twig or a structure before you go to bed at night, and it has grasped on by morning. It's living and it, it grows where you want it to go. The tendrils will reach out where you don't want them to go if you don't let them. So. Early people saw a religious connection to that, like life. It's a living plant, it gives us life, it shades us under the grape arbor, and it grows and reaches with its tendrils. Therefore, the symbol of grapes would decorate, for example, on the left, that's an exquisite mosaic from Tunisia, and it would decorate a dining room where people would be feasting on grapes and they would have that exquisite mosaic around them. And on the right, we have a Byzantine bracelet very, very old and yet so modern, isn't it? Look at all the goldsmithing technique. The Byzantine Empire in Constantinople kept what's now Istanbul, kept the Roman civilization going for a long time after Rome had fallen, in, in, in quotes, in 476. They kept a lot of the goldsmithing techniques alive and even innovated and made them better. That bracelet with the motif in the center and two bayonet clasps that make the, the, the motif move and make the bracelet open is so incredibly modern. Look at the techniques, look at the filigree, the granulation, we could all learn a lot from it. But our interest today, of course, is how the language of flowers would be in that bracelet. Gold, to wear plain gold, plain, very embellished, was the right of every citizen. By 529 in our common era, a little bit later, Justinian made Justinian's Code, which is still the basis of law in Europe today. And he had to say pearls only for very limited number of people because people would bankrupt themselves to get pearls. Emeralds, rubies, sapphires, limited numbers of people. But every citizen could wear gold. And therefore we have what you could say almost a popular jewel. And something, if you go uh, in, in museum and you want to learn about the Celts, uh, the, the, the Celtic uh, civilization, uh, we can, uh, um, uh, maybe, yeah, thank you. Uh, most of the artifacts you'll see w would be made out of gold, actually. Lots of archaeological museums are actually filled with jewelry pieces because sometimes it's the only uh, uh, witness we have of those cultures because it was so precious, it was kept apart. And sometimes it's the last testimony we have of all those civilizations. I wish that the only testimony we'll have of our culture will be jewelry, because of course it will be appreciated, I know for sure, and not the rest. Well, so yes, that's some other beautiful pieces. But. We're on a quest for the jewelry arts to, be, to regain what we call their letters of nobility, which they certainly still had in the Renaissance. We'll talk about that later. Absolutely. Yeah. And um, in the very complex uh, Celtic culture, we find um, uh, mistletoes. Mistletoes, uh, you, you might not be familiar uh, with it. It's a plant that, uh, it's like a parasite, actually, that grows on the tree, and um, just like ivy, in a way, and it just shapes a kind of a, a bowl. And uh, the miracle, in a way, is that uh, you can see it very clearly in winter, because the, the flowers will flourish in winter. And like this, you can sit in the trees because the trees won't have leaves anymore. So you can see the, the mistletoe. So it was seen as a kind of a special plant in a way. And the, the druids, so the, the, the Celts, um, 
uh, religious uh, people in charge, <laughs> I don't know how to say, um, priests in a way, they were not priests, but they were like, maybe more like shamans in a way, they would uh, 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 harvest it and made um, a potion, made a medicine out of it because it was supposed to be uh, very good for you. And uh, it's quite interesting to see that this uh, uh, tomb from uh, the S region in, in Germany uh, showing a, a prince uh, of Globerg, but also associated with the god uh, Taranis, which is the equivalent of Zeus uh, for the, the Celts. But you can see he has big Mickey Mouse ears, which are of course not his ears. Uh, they are actually mistletoe uh, uh, petals, uh, and it's connected to the, um, to the sky, to the superior uh, element. It's, it's like a, cr a crown uh, uh, a wreath, in a way, uh, and you can recognize the petals, the shapes of, um, of a mistletoe. Now, uh, very, uh, uh, very recently, well, not so recently, but compared to the Celts, it's quite recently, uh, when uh, René Lalique, the great uh, jeweler from the Art Nouveau period, was working for the Maison Vever, he was at that time only a designer, a dessinateur en chambre. You can see he designed those uh, uh, mistletoe uh, uh, flowers that, that are also quite reminiscent of the dragonfly uh, insect. And dragonflies were extremely important for Art Nouveau because they would associate Japan, um, Japanese, uh, all those new uh, fashion in a way. And it, I think it's fascinating. And here is the genius of uh, René Lalique to see in the same pattern, in the same uh, jewel, elements from the, the Celts, from the Celtic uh, culture, and some Japanese um, reminiscence, in a way. It's interesting, too, because in the American and English tradition, it's completely different. The French see it as a parasite they have to tear down because it hurts the trees. But in the English and American tradition, it's hung in the hallways of the home at Christmas time, because if you can manage to give a little smooch to someone you, you for, with whom you're smitten, shall I say, you might end up together or even be married. It's almost like a pre-marriage thing. So you'll try to, there are even songs about meet me under the mistletoe. Where does that all come from? Let's remember what Leonard said. It's something that stays green around December 21st. Let's remember, up there in the north, up where we are, on December 21st, if you've been up there, it's black, dark at four, and it's dark at nine. Dramatic changes. In the morning, it's still dark, the moon's up. So the ancestors used to think, what if we're naughty, like the Christmas song, what if you're naughty or nice, and the powers that be up above don't turn the lights back up? What if they just keep dimming them down? So they used what was green, what stayed green, as a symbol that yes, around December 21st, or on December 21st, the solstice, it would start to get brighter again, and it did. Again, connection with the actual qualities of the plants and our interpretation of what they mean, right? It can always change, but we'll see it doesn't change that much. Uh, some of them, the interpretation can be opposite, but you can see that because of the context when uh, all those flowers flourish, yes. even if the region or the culture is totally different, sometimes we'll find a parallelism. Uh, the parallel of the fleur-de-lis, now this is a weird one because the fleur-de-lis, there's a giant debate about what flower it even is. Is it a completely concocted flower? Is it a flower Leonard's going to tell us about later? Is it a lily? It doesn't actually look like a lily at all, and yet we all know what a fleur-de-lis is. There are coat hooks, there's everything else. It's a, a symbol that succeeded a lot. And it's a symbol that came from heraldry. That is, the symbols that noble families in Europe built up to kind of say they were noble, because they were making themselves into nobles. And the fleur-de-lis, very early, there's a big thing. The Medicis used it. Uh, it was used in Europe. And one of the earliest times that it was used is in this crown on the left. Princess Blanche's crown is a marvel, because there were many crowns like this. We know from paintings like the paintings of Jan van Eyck, there were many. They're gone, melted in the pot. One of the biggest things that happened to medieval jewelry was in the pot, melted, gone. But here we have this marvel in the Residence Museum in Munich. You must visit it. You must visit that little gallery, huge in terms of the amount of, of, of fantastic jewelry that's still there. Do you know that this crown is as high as it is in diameter? 
18 centimeters. It's just like Gothic architecture. It's just like Saint Chapelle in Paris. It's a jeweled version of that. It's defying gravity. It's vaulting upwards. It's open. It's marvelous. And it was made in the 1300s, the Middle Ages. How do we know it was made in the 1300s? Because Anne of Bohemia brought it with her for her marriage to Richard II of England in 1382. And Richard II of England, like many English people, was a very good at his accounting. And he had a big, giant inventory roll made of all his goods made just before 1399, just before he was thrown out, and Henry IV takes over. And Henry IV sends this crown with Blanche to Munich when she leaves to marry Louis of Bavaria. Therefore, we have the dates within a five, six year range. We know the crown is really of the time, and thankfully the Germans preserved it all the way through till now. All right, that said, let's have a look. Do you see the the pearl clusters, the flower pearl clusters with the rubies or spinels in between. Do you see at the very tops of each stem the, the, the fleur-de-lis formation? This is, the whole crown is dedicated toward moving us toward that symbol. Let's bear that in mind. And then let's look on the right at a very modern jewel, brand new in terms of what we're talking about today, but one of the most ancient symbols, the rose. And everyone has probably heard of the War of the Roses. As one of my favorite historians says, the only thing rosy about that war was the thorns of a rose, because it was just a horrible, useless, miserable war. Oh, let's not talk about that. Let's talk about when it finally ends. When it finally ends, the Lancasters and the Yorks make peace. Henry VII, his, he's a tutor, so his rose is red. The Lancasters, their rose is white. Henry marries Elizabeth of York, and they create a new rose, which is both red and white. And that's the end of the Lancaster-York fights. They're going to start some other fights in England. So that rose is kept as the badge, the red rose inside the white rose. And what do we have? We have a beautiful Gaurard high jewelry new rose keeping alive that tradition. Very interesting how we can come all the way forward in time and use one of the most kind of tragic end of tragedy healing symbols to make a brand new gorgeous jewel. And then if we move forward, we can go to look at the next subject, which is our next chapter. Exactly, Asia. If we, if we dive into uh, Asian culture, um, mainly Chinese, but also Thai, Cambodian, uh, uh, Japanese, of course, um, we can see that there is a strong difference not so much about the meaning or the interpretation of the flowers, but on the relationship that artists will have with them. Uh, it's um, what we call, uh, what we could call, um, August, uh, Augustus object. The, the object monogure. Um, it's lucky, actually. Yes. Uh, it's uh, Auger, the augurs the good fortune. Auguring, a u g u r, good for exactly. Good fortune. They will be used for their um, as, as lucky charm almost. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we can start by, by the lotus. Actually, there is not so many flowers. Flowers are everywhere in Asian art, but you won't find a huge diversity. You'll no. kind of find always the same. Good point. Um, not always, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm being general. And of course, you'll find lotus. Why lotus is so important in, in Asia? Of course, it's associated with uh, Buddhism, but also the very plant itself is um, a paradox in a way. Because if you look at a lotus flower, it's beautiful with huge petal flower. But once again, the context is stagnant water, muddy waters, lakes. And so you see this beautiful flower flourishing on, what's, on something which is not so nice, actually. And this is this contrast, this um, symbolism, this pa uh, parallel, um, will be used as an analogy of the person you can become and uh, from compared to what you, you, you're from, actually. And of course, it's also the true essence of uh, Buddhism. You, you have to reach the nirvana. You have to, 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 to your quest must be to, to, to obtain this, uh, to reach this status. And in a way, the, 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 the lotus flower embodies uh, this um, uh, meditation. Uh, of course, you'll see on many, many uh, um, Buddhist cultures, uh, Buddha sitting on a lotus flower. 
but you also see you also see uh, the very flower itself represented in different contexts in, in different uh, meaning but there will be always this idea of perfection of purity of um, virginity and uh, of extreme uh, beauty by contrast in a way uh, and this is why when the the, the maison van Kleffen Harpels wanted to pay uh, an homage to the asian culture through uh, um, its collection bal de légende Bal de Légende was a collection dedicated to uh, dancing uh, balls that were uh, uh, organized uh, in France, but uh, all, over, all over the world. And there was this great ball uh, which was um, organized on the Il um, uh, Saint Louis in, in Paris, uh, in, in the, uh, 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 I'm missing the name of the hotel. Hotel Lambert. Hotel Lambert, thank right you. Right on the tip. I should remember. Um, which furniture had just been which, sold. Which now belongs to the free.fr uh, telephone guy. <laughs> yeah. Uh, one of, one of the, the lady uh, coming to this uh, uh, ball, which was uh, Ellen de Rothschild, I, I think, was dressed as a Cambodian uh, uh, dancer. And so, uh, as a reminiscence of this uh, party, uh, the Maison uh, made this uh, lotus flower next to a Thai slash Cambodian dancer. So uh, also resting on a kind of a, a nenuphar, huh, we could say. And uh, it's quite interesting because uh, for centuries, lotus flowers were not so appreciated in Europe. We, we really had to wait for Japanese art to come to Europe, for Japan to open again as a, a lotus flower, for um, the impressionists to, to look at them. And of course, th then it will, be, it will be huge. Think about Claude Monet. Uh, 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 Les if you if you go to Paris, you have to see Les Nymphéas in the, the Musée de l'Orangerie. In Musée de l'Orangerie, it's like a, a mystical experience almost. And it's, of course, uh, based on this Japanese experience and this vision of uh, nature. And here we have on the upper right is a pink opal. Yeah. So the lapidary had to carve the lotus completely out of one pink opal. Uh, in fact, Ikebana and the language of flowers and actual flower arranging is something that uh, Japanese, even the samurai, would, it was considered part of the training of a samurai that you would need to know how to arrange of flowers. And uh, here we're looking at sort of two cross-pollinated ways of looking at another flower that's one of the oldest flower that shows up in Asian art, the peony. On the left, we have a Chinese piece, an exquisite five-color porcelain, which is an interesting uh, way of showing the peony in a very kind of stylized way. And on the right, we have Alexis Feliz, the Maison of Alexis Feliz, great triumphant artists in enamel who are looking especially at Japanese art and looking at ways that the peony can be expressed in enamel. What is the peony? It's, it's a flower that uh, is connected, especially in Japan, with the royals, with the royal house all the way back from the ninth century. But it was brought over from China during the ninth century, which is the Tang Dynasty, by the Buddhists, who also brought tea and Buddhism and art. Uh, often we say Chinese art is frozen Tang Dynasty art, which is kind of a pun on the the juice, the old juice from my childhood. So Tang Dynasty is a time when in China. The peony is the symbol that it stays. As Leonard says, symbols, these are powerful languages of symbols, but not the multiplicity. You don't need the huge giant dictionaries that you use for the West. You have some symbols that are forever powerful. The peony is bounty, summer's bounty, that, that wishing someone peonies is that the bursting, the bursting health and gorgeousness of June would last forever, the beauty of these peonies that explode overnight. Uh, you would find peonies on wedding robes. You find them on vases and gifts, porcelain gifts that would be for a wedding. Interestingly, more ambivalent in Europe, for instance, one of the European traditions, which I think is related, is that never dig up a peony bush when it's not blooming because the fairies will get angry at you. Well, again, I grew up with peony bushes on our farm, and I was also the grass cutter. I was the lawnmower person. It was just my mother and me. And my mother would say, never mow near the peonies, you'll kill them. And I knew that if I mowed anywhere near those, I, could I was in a lot of trouble. So the peony has to be protected because it seems like it's not there, and then whoop, it shows up. Uh, once again, so the opulent peony is a symbol of that beauty and wishing for beauty to stay in people's lives forever. And on that plate, we saw peony, but there were also uh, some other flowers. Yeah. And among them, chrysanthemum, no, but it's okay. Chrysanthemum, which are 
also one of the most important flower in Asia and which are quite popular also in Europe. Alors, they are popular for the same reason. The reason is that those flowers flourishes in fall, at the end of the, at the, of the year. So at the time far away from spring, at the time where flowers should not flourish again. So once again, they're seen as a paradox, they're seen as a, as a miracle, which is also a sign of good fortune, uh, meaning that at the end of a cycle, maybe something new comes up and uh, the story continue. In a way, it's, uh, um, it is uh, associated with hope, it is associated with very positive uh, value. And you can see uh, on this uh, uh, piece of jewelry at the right that you can see at the exhibition, maybe uh, you've seen it. It's one of the, uh, if I had to pick 10 pieces from the whole Van Cleef and Arpel creations ever, it would be in it. It's, it's technically, well, Go feast your eyes on it in the exhibition because there's no comparison, no photograph can bring to life the way that piece, and you can also see the design for it. We, we'll talk about it tomorrow, yes. so I won't spoil yes. anything. But as you can see, it is, uh, you can wear it uh, facing uh, up or down because it will be never up or down. Uh, if you lo look at the petals, if you look at the way uh, um, the flower is, is, uh, is shaped, you can see it's getting down, but also going up, and this works uh, both ways. And this is really the idea about uh, um, um, chrysanthemum. So, of course, in Europe, it will be associated with um, uh, with the Day of the Dead because it's in, during the Toussaint in November that we pay tribute to our ancestors, to our deceased. So there is a kind of a dark uh, aspect to it, kind of sad, but also beautiful in a way. Whereas in Asia, it would be a totally different uh, uh, approach. And in America, it's associated with Thanksgiving, football, uh, chrysanthemums on the table to watch the Super Bowl. So everybody has their associations. The orchid, the association in the period of Art Nouveau, the period of the Philip Wolfer's jewel on the right, and also the Japanese, uh, I'm going to pronounce it terribly if we have any Japanese friends, Suigetsu Ikeda, uh, he, he made a whole book of orchid portraits, really, during the Art Deco period. There's a connection for both of them. The orchid was exotic, exotically, extravagantly, unbelievably expensive. So you wanted to have living orchids in your house to make your friends gasp at the beauty and the exoticism because these are plants that can hang from a tree. You can see the roots. It's kind of miraculous. How on earth do they even grow in the air? So this painter made a portrait of the man's, of this wealthy man's orchids, his living orchids on the left. And on the right, Philippe Wolfers, one of the great masters of Art Nouveau, makes a giant plique a jour enamel that's enamel that has no back, like stained glass windows, enamel orchid as a jewel, a triumph of savoir-faire and also a triumph of exoticism. Now, the old symbols in the old Latin words for orchid were symbols of male and female uh, fertility and health. So there's a duality. In the modern sense, it was simply the fact that it was exotically expensive. You could say like an Hermes bag. I mean, why $100,000 for a pocketbook? God, you know, that's the way it is. But that's the same kind of thing. In those days, it was exotically expensive. Like we could think of the tulip, who, which was a completely Middle Eastern flower, came to Holland and made a whole financial crisis go all the way across Europe. So flowers can be extremely expensive, one single flower. Absolutely, uh, the tulipomania that occurred in early uh, 17th century. Another flower that drives people crazy, <laughs> it's uh, the sakura, of course, the cherry tree uh, flower. If you're in Japan uh, during that time, and every Japanese would tell you, you have to be in Japan during that time, you, you, you will be uh, totally overwhelmed by the, this, the huge trees that are turning, at, turning up uh, pink with all those flowers uh, uh, spread uh, um, among the winds. And it's, of course, extremely beautiful. It's extremely romantic, but it's also a very short time. So it, it occurs between one and two weeks. So it also means that you really should appreciate things while they're there and you should, everything passes in a way. And once again, uh, in this very um, um, analogic uh, way of thinking uh, in Asia, I think we always think by comparison in a way, or with also with context. Uh, the cherry tree is a kind of a spectacle, a kind of a miracle that you know won't last, 
and so you have to, to appreciate it to, uh, the most. And we, we find it in many, many etchings. Uh, if, you, if you look at uh, ukiyo-e art, like uh, etchings by Hiroshige, for instance, you'll see sometimes those huge uh, touches of, uh, of pink, um, which are associated to cherry trees, but it could also be, well, it's actually prunus flower. Uh, it could be apricots, it could be some apple trees also. Uh, so there is different symbolism to, to it. And uh, there will always be five petals also. It's, so there is a, a kind of a numerology associated with it, uh, associated with, with, with gods, with poets. It, it associates both the culture, the religion, nature in a whole, uh, whole system in a way that, which makes it extremely um, meaningful. The cherry blossom, actually you make me think the word for ukiyo-e, floating world, the cherry blossoms float in the wind. When you have one windy, rainy day, they all fall off the trees and you have pink snow everywhere on the ground, which is why in Japan they have national holiday to go admire the cherry blossom. And on the right, those are actually diamonds that are cut pink, so you see cherry blossoms inside the diamonds. By a company named Sakura Diamond. <laughs> yes. We can't talk about Asian symbolism without talking about bamboo. And Leonard had mentioned the oak tree the laureate that could not be just laurel leaves, but the diadem could be made of, of oak leaves too. The Chinese have a saying, which I find incredibly potent, and which is a very East versus West um, powerful symbol. They say the oak is very solid and very strong, but if the lightning cracks it or the wind hits it too hard, it breaks, it does not bend. Kind of like the Westerner. The bamboo like an Easterner, bends in the wind. It bends in the storm, and it does not break. It's very interesting. So the bamboo bends, but does not break. The jade on the left is, is fascinating because it's carved. It's a celadon color, so it's an exquisite color to start. And the jade is very difficult to carve. It's been intricately carved to look like a brush pot for a scholar's table. The brush pot is made of bamboo. So they've taken one precious material, jade, which is absolutely beyond precious. Le Cole will have a class just on jade soon. And they recreate the bamboo brush pot as bamboo. Kind of perfect, with other symbols that are very important next to it. And the, the crane and the, and the ruyi fungus. And then on the right, we have a young Japanese jeweler who says that his jewels are from a garden and they are a garden. He uses white enamel, very difficult. White enamel is connected with medieval jewelry, actually. He uses white enamel. That's not transparent. It's flat white enamel, shiny white enamel. And he embeds green enamel into the jewel to show you the lusciousness of bamboo. And then he has sculptural bamboo bending and coming out of the enamel. So that's gold carved, coated in enamel. And then on the right, it's weird. I'd like to actually ask him. He does respond on Instagram. That's something called heavenly bamboo with those red berries. It's not bamboo, and it's actually poisonous. So I don't know if he's making some kind of allegory, or he simply, he says he simply likes the, the beauty of flowers. So bamboo and heavenly bamboo, but not bamboo. Interesting. So finally, we're going to come on our third chapter. What is the contemporary mythology? Of course, we're going to see that uh, nowadays jeweler will keep, of course, all those traditions, all those symbols, all those meanings. But we'll find that also new flowers will come up uh, to the to the landscape in a way, like uh, hydrangea. Uh, hydrangea, for a reason that I do not do not know, was not so popular uh, among jewelers uh, in the past. It really uh, uh, came back during uh, uh, maybe, the Art, Art Nouveau era. Maybe because it's so difficult to do. If you think about it, how are you going to recreate a hydrangea as a jewel? It's quite complex to, to, to create. It's quite beautiful, too. Um, the hydrangea, you, if, you, if you go to France, you, you go to Brittany, you'll see them uh, everywhere. It's quite, uh, quite a complex flower to, to, to tame, in a way. Uh, it needs a lot of water. And the very name hydrangea uh, uh, contains the, uh, the word uh, water in Greek, hydro, hydra. And uh, hydrangea means that um, it, it, it looks like a, a vase, something you could, you could pour water uh, out of. Um, it's, it, it can, it mostly time, most of the time it's blue, but it can be almost any color. It can be white, it can be pink. It, it's quite, quite a fantastic flower. It's very fashionable nowadays. 
And uh, you, we can see that uh, contemporary jewelers like Yigit Fazulianov from Russia is a, a Tatar uh, uh, um, a jeweler well, com coming from the Tatar culture in, in, in Russia, uh, managed to create this new Art Nouveau spirit hydrogen gel ring with a, a pearl in the center on, on, of it. And we were talking about difficult things to do in jewelry. You can see that this pearl is faceted, just like a gemstone. And I can tell you that this is quite a complex, <laughs> it's quite a complex thing to do. And it's, it's of course, a, a beautiful piece. Uh, on, on the left, we can see a, a painting by uh, uh, Bert Morisot. Bert Morisot was one of the f uh, favorite uh, uh, model by uh, uh, Manet, uh, Edouard Manet, uh, uh, great painter from the 19th century. Um, kind of impressionist, but not, not really. And uh, she was a, pa a painter herself. And here you can see she, she painted, um, uh, I think it is herself, uh, next, to, next to a friend. And you can see the, this huge uh, Hortensia, this huge Adonja next to her. We don't know why the French call it Hortensia. Actually, we, we thought it was because of the, um, it was named after the name of the daughter, uh, Hortense de Beauharnais, which was the daughter of Josephine, the Empress Josephine, the wife of Napoleon, first wife of Napoleon. But actually, it's wrong. Uh, it was probably named after um, a female botanist from the 18th century. Uh, but once again, there is still debate uh, around this. But quite, quite a fascinating plant, of course. Another fascinating plant is the magnolia. The magnolia in America, where there's a movie called Steel Magnolias, fabulous movie, it's in the southern part of America, you will always find it in wedding bouquets because it's a sim the combination of strength the pure whiteness is the purity of the soul combined together in a strong woman. Magnolia has had that symbolism all the way back through time, but it also, again, had some ambivalent symbolism in Europe for a while. And it becomes more fascinating to see why Henry Matisse, in that painting on the left, we know, we're lucky to know that there were a huge number of preparatory drawings that he did to prepare to do that one perfect white flower with so few strokes. It's really almost like calligraphy, isn't it? And it's right smack dab in the center of the painting. On the right, we thought this was interesting to look at something that's so strong and is a symbol of resilience and withstanding all kinds of adversity, the magnolia, used by Annabella Chen, who likes to work with recycled materials. So she used recycled aluminum and she tinted it with um, gold coating to make it kind of gold. Recycled aluminum to show a magnolia. It's another point of view. Another flower which is starting to getting more and more um, popular among jewelers um, is of course Kaya Lily. So we're entering into this uh, complex universe of lilies. There's Lily of the Valley, of course, that you offer in, in, in springtime to, to your loved ones. There is the Fleur de Lys, which may, is maybe not a lys after, after all. I'm, I'm pushing for the Fleur d'Iris, but it's because my, my sister is called Iris. And here, of course, you have this big uh, uh, Cala Lilis that you'll find in many paintings of the 50s, of the 60s. If you look at Diego Rivera's painting in Mexico, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, of course, already in the 20s, almost in those almost abstract shape very, uh, very contrasted because uh, Calalilis will always have a very pure, monochromous, uh, matte white uh, color with this uh, yellow pistil in the center, which is, of course, a perfect occasion for a master, a young master like uh, Emmanuel Tarpin, who is one of the rising stars of uh, So she's very steeped in the exotic, uh, surrounded, I'm sure, as a child by these tropical flowers, and she brings them to life in her jewels. Uh, poppies. 
Poppies, again, we go back to ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, poppies were used as medicine for surgery. People actually in ancient Egypt had anesthesia. Poppies were always associated for medicine to sleep. They're associated with dreams and sleep. They're also associated with peaceful sleep. So they're associated with passing on. And after World War I, the terrible, tragic loss of, of young life, it became a symbol for the widows and the families who were left behind. And England carries on the tradition to this day. On the lower left, you see artificial poppies that are sold by the millions, and all the money is gone to supporting people from the armed forces who have lost loved ones. And everybody, as the time for Remembrance Day, also known as Armistice Day, comes up, people buy them and wear them. You see everyone wearing them from all the royal family to everyone all over England. A symbol of remembrance, it's interesting, it's a humble paper jewel that's bought with real money to support a great cause. Uh, then above it, we placed a work by the jar, Joel Arthur Rosenthal. Those of us who love art in jewelry, we love Joel Arthur Rosenthal. He is anti, uh, counterintuitive uh, in every way. Nothing in his windows. You have to try to figure out a way to get an appointment. You may try on a piece of jewelry and be ready to buy it. He may say, no, it's not for you. Uh, and he made a completely beautiful and surprising poppy with using pink and green tourmalines. So you've got two, you've got the poppy in its bud form with the pink and green tourmalines. You've got tourmalines creating the swirling stem that goes to the flowering poppy on the left, carved by a, a spectacular French lapidary. And then you've got a nice, a nice pear-shaped diamond sitting on its side in the middle. Why not? That's jar. Uh, and then on the Actually, the, the only two times I saw things in jars, uh, uh, vitrine in jar, jars windows, were dead leaves yes. and, and chestnuts. And dust. I've but seen dust. Actual dead yes. leaves, chestnuts. And yeah. actual dust, which coming from a lifetime lived in the great Maisons, um, director of education with Van Cleef and Arpels before joining the school at the very beginning. Uh, that's a sh beyond shock to me. The word dust connected with a but, jewelry window. But you would look at as a, <laughs> you would look at a dead leaf just like as a, a jewel piece, <laughs> and it, it, it's very beautiful. It's not provocation. I think it's very poetic. It's a, a, a move he, he does for for the people to look around them and to, to the, appreciate nature. The man is an artist. He he's true to his to his mission and everybody is in awe, absolutely. On the right, we're in awe also, of course, of Mika, sorry, Mika Ninagawa, who is a fantastic artist. She did the beautiful installation that we had with our Flora exhibition uh, for Van Cleef and Arpels. She is an artist who uses photography to do fabulous things, which bring out the actual vibrancy and nature of flowers themselves. So we wanted to give a moment to look at, at Mika's piece before we go on to our conclusion. Um, flowers, plants, leaves. Nature is absolutely an endless source of inspiration. Uh, the, the Taj, T-H-A-J, sorry for my pronunciation, treasure that's here in the museum is loaded with these beautiful uh, stamped uh, gold daisy. They look like daisy motifs that accompanied the lady to her eternal rest uh, 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago. Jewels, gold, jewelry, flowers are always remembered and, and joined together to inspire. And finally, we have three pieces to sort of sum up everything. Quite, quite different pieces. Um, the one on the left is uh, uh, fascinating. It's uh, by the Maison Hammerley. Hammerley is this very traditional maison from uh, Germany. It was a jewelry house which we uh, make medals of honor, uh, chivalry order, something quite aristocratic in a way. And they took an artistic shift in the recent years, which is uh, very successful, I think, from an artistic point of view. Uh, also assisted with the evolution of the family, new weddings, etc. And um, here you can see they, they managed to, to craft uh, gold in a very uh, personal and typical way. Uh, it's actually a secret, the type of gold they're they are doing and, and using uh, to create those uh, physalis uh, flowers. So another flower very popular in uh, Asia also. Uh, in Europe, uh, we call it um, des amours en cage. Love and it has vitamin C. You can eat it. Love in a cage. Yeah. So it's, it's not those. 
<laughs> but what, this is what it means. It just means that love is there somewhere, but maybe it's uh, being held. And the, the, maybe you can recognize what is in the center of the piece. Almost it, hidden. It's actually a pearl, a mellow, mellow pearl, which are extremely rare, of course, from the Philippines. And incredibly expensive. So the idea of hiding this exquisite pearl, sheltering it, is even the more stunning. And then in the middle, Victoire de Castellan in Dior jewelry, she makes it makes me think of the Venus flytrap, the little, the, it's the carnivorous plant with a black opal in the middle, and instead of a nice, well-shaped uh, prongs, it's got real claws. And it's interesting because holding the stone with grief, the French word for the prongs, is actually claws. So she has real claws. And then she has these big green leaves around this flower that she calls uh, Gran Opalia Devorus. It's a made-up word, but you get the idea. On the right, a very different, and this is our last piece, leading you into time, nature, love, if I may. It's a garden swing, all in precious stones, diamond swing, diamond trunk to the tree, and the tree has multicolored sapphires and diamonds. That tree with the swing flowing in the breeze is from the 2008 Gardens collection of Van Cleef and Arpels. That was my first year with Van Cleef and Arpels, and it's when I fell irrevocably in love. This gardens collection, Japanese gardens, Italian Renaissance gardens, mm -hmm. English Romantic gardens, and the French gardens of Versailles, the very classicist structured gardens. Yes, this is the Romantic garden of England. Did the loved ones just leave? Did a mother just push a child on the swing? Are they coming right now? The whole thing is open in that swing which actually moves with pearled, pearled ropes. It's also very 18th century, very uh, uh, Fragonard. Huh? Uh, you think about all those rocaille paintings from the Wallach Connection, from all those museums, uh, um, uh, for François Boucher, etc. You always see those couples around swings. And you always think it's kind of frivolous. It's a very light matter. But actually, when you think about that time, 18th century, it's also the time where science will discover a pesanteur, in a way, attraction. And so it's quite scientific, in a way, because it represents also a new relationship with the it's world. true, centrifugal force. Exactly. And so uh, uh, just like I, I hope when you see a swing, you'll think about scientific discoveries from the 18th century. We hope that when you'll see flowers, maybe you won't see so frivolous uh, patterns, but also beautiful, meaningful things um, that will allow so, you to meditate. And, so and whether it's Cartesian uh, contemplation of uh, centrifugal force or whether it's a mom pushing a baby on a swing, you could lose yourself, obviously, in, in flower symbolism in jewels. We thank you very much. And with our next slide, we have our uh, QR code if you'd like to continue with us on Instagram. If anyone has any questions, we can take the questions now or ask us on Instagram or Facebook and Leonard Puy and I will answer them. We're very happy to continue going forward with you. Uh, your ne our next on live, online live conversation is here, I think, tomorrow. tomorrow night. And then you, on February 1st, are flying back to Paris and you're going to discuss an academician's sword. As it sounds, yeah, <laughs> no, no, it's true. Uh, Pascal, Pascal, Pascal Horry's uh, uh, Academician uh, Sword by uh, Thierry Vendôme. Thierry Vendôme, great friend of L'Ecole, with many uh, talks by Thierry on our YouTube playlist channel, which you can also enjoy if you're with us tonight. Thank you, Inizita. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Shukran, and see you very, very soon.